I want to thank Rich Strong, who's standing here, for putting that together for us. And um, I think it just uh, livens us up a little bit. As you can imagine, conventions don't create themselves. They take a whole team full of people and a lot of time and effort to put all of the details. It's a very complex puzzle that we put together. So I'd like to start with just a few acknowledgments for specifics uh, who have really helped this particular conference. Um, the um, MEA board, I'd like to thank the MEA board for selecting Denver as a site and giving us this opportunity to have you all here as guests. I would certainly like to thank Metropolitan State University of Denver and uh, our sponsors. We have sponsors who are publishers. Some are restaurants. We have uh, departments within MSU Denver. So we've had a lot of uh, support for us this year. I'd like to thank the Spring Hill Suites. I know not everybody was able to get a room there, but they have been very, very helpful in helping us uh, think through this conference. I would like to thank Auraria, the campus. That's the combined effort. We have three institutions on this campus, and they have been very helpful in making sure that our rooms are set up, that we have technology in every room, that we are, are good to go uh, for all of that. I'd like to thank Vanilla Bean Catering. That's also part of our local institution, and they have worked very hard with us to provide our snacks and our, our banquet for Saturday night. Lamba Paeda is the Communication Honor Society, and you'll see people in green shirts. We're doing mobile signage in addition to our yard signs and, and other kinds of signs. And so the, the uh, Yukali, would you stand up and show the green shirt? Yes, yes. Okay, so you see somebody in a green shirt? You can ask her where things are, or she can, she can take you any place on campus. I'd like to thank Phil Rose, who has been so kind and so supportive. Anytime I was upset over something, I could email Phil, and he was like, Mr. Calm. It was great. Uh, I'd like to thank Paul Sukup, who is our treasurer. He's over at the registration desk, but he, too, has just been answering questions. has just been there every step of the way. We had a wonderful planning committee, committee uh, on campus, mostly uh, local people from around Denver. Uh, I'd like to thank all the paper reviewers. We had people reviewing the uh, initial papers for acceptance into the convention. Then we had another group of reviewers who looked at uh, which papers were going to be uh, considered for best paper. And um, then a final group who decided on which paper actually made the number one spot. I'd like to thank Jim Furr, our cameraman. He is part of our broadcast faculty and uh, is graciously giving his summer time to be here videotaping most all of our conference sessions. So not only the plenaries, but uh, the conference over in the Tivoli as well. I already thank Rich Strong, but he has been our, our video expert and will continue to play a role throughout the conference. And then my two left arm, right arm people, Yukali McAdam, uh, she is our uh, administrative assistant. She had never been to a conference before, and so at first it was, it was a little touch and go. We really had to figure it out, but boy, by the end, she really understood what, what we needed from her. And so she did a lot of work on the program and um, communicating with all of you folks. And then finally, and I don't know, Jackie, are you here? Oh, she's not here. She's probably, she's probably over at the registration table. Jackie is our program administrator, and she is a, a logistics queen. She uh, got a little cranky periodically through the process, but she just came through and has really been on top of things. And so I thank all of those people. Really appreciate everything that they've done. We have a, a couple of uh, leaders here who want to welcome you both to the university and to the city of Denver. And I want to start with Dr. Joan Foster. Dr. Joan Foster, by the way, is my boss. She's the dean of the College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. It is the largest college at this university, and Joan is particularly adept at working with diverse styles, opinions, and backgrounds. She's never claimed to be the media expert. Isn't that fair? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, she's always interested in knowing how it all works. Joan is a Denver native and a graduate of East High School. She studied abroad in Brazil and graduated from MSU Denver with a biology major and a math minor. So she's formidable as dean, as you can imagine. She went on to earn her MS and PhD in biology at the University of Denver, specializing in microbial physiology and microbial ecology. So you can see that she understands ecology as a concept. 
She has won a number of awards, including the Metropolitan State University Plain and Fancy Person of the Year in 1996, the Distinguished Alumnus in that same year, and the Distinguished Service Award in 2005. When I ask colleagues to describe Joan, they use words like smart, collaborative, wise, fair, resourceful, and centered. She's active in the community. Her support for media ecology has been very much appreciated. She's been cheering us along all the way. So representing the leadership of Metropolitan State University of Denver, please join me in welcoming Dr. Joan Foster. Thank you, Karen. Just, oh, it's not touch screen. I asked. No. Okay, just one second. I am not a media person. Okay, so Rich is going to help me. Slide you. Let yes. You start, and then it's the right arrow. Perfect. Great. So I want to welcome you. Um, Karen just did a great welcome, and I think our remarks are going to overlap. We didn't coordinate between the two of us, partially because we're both working on them. She at 2 a.m., me at um, 6 a.m. So, uh, but at any rate, welcome to our campus. And this looks like a great conference. I am so excited to have it here on campus with us, the 16th Annual Convention of the Media Ecology Association. And yes, I do not know media ecology very well. That will become evident at the very end. I'll try three slides on it. Um, but Karen has been filling me in for several years. We've been talking about this. It's very interesting. I did a lot of research on it. I read through your conference program a couple times. And then I used Wikipedia. We know what a great source of information that is. So give me a little grace. <laughs> any rate, um, oops, I didn't. I want to really acknowledge Karen Lawler um, as being sort of the head of this, of coordinating this, of getting permission, both from the MEA board, thank you for having it here, and from the university, and then coordinating the details with the help of Jackie Kirby. And I put pictures in here just so it would be less boring. Um, I actually left the classroom before we started doing PowerPoints. So I've been on the dark side for a long time for academics. But I want to thank you, um, the planning committee. Karen already went through a lot of them. Um, I've listed them up here. These are all in your conference program. So the planning committee had Frank Dance, um, William Huddy, Sam Jay, Jackie Kirby, David Cottonstead, Karen Lawler, Yukari McAdam, and Richard Strong, who's been helping me with the media here. And then additional thanks, and I thought it was interesting that the treasurer was listed first, but then we have Denver's auditor here, so he probably applauds this. Um, and where would we be without keeping track of the finances? And I was treasurer of my branch organization a while back, and that's a huge job. Um, Phil Rose is the president of the MEA, has helped Karen a lot, and helps um, the whole organization go forward. Um, Brian Cogan with the awards. Tom Check, Natalie Warren, um, and then Katia Campbell and Rebecca Dobbin. They're all Metropolitan State University of Denver, or MSU Denver employees. And then Villa Bean, Vanilla Bean has helped us as well. And then paper reviewing, that is a hard job too. So I wanted to make sure I acknowledge them. Um, Jan Buterman, Andrew Crystal, Sam Jay, Gary Kenton, Alex Kuskis, and Mike Monsoor. That's our state flower, by the way, the Columbine. Um, as Karen mentioned very briefly, we're on the Auraria Higher Education Center. Now, then the state of Colorado built the 150-acre Auraria Higher Education Center starting in 1976 is when I was actually still a student here. And so I remember moving on to campus at that time. And um, it's, it's a wonderful concept where we have three higher ed institutions sharing one space. It's good for the students because they can take classes in the different institutions through different ins um, agreements that we have. This concert hall would not have been built for any one of those institutions, but having three come together, we got this gorgeous, with good acoustics, concert hall. Um, so that's a great part of it. The challenging part is trying to share 
It's always interesting to share space. So we're also separating into neighborhoods at this point. This is a historical site. Um, if you're East Coast, you're going to laugh at us because we're so young. Colorado became a state in 1876. This is Auraria, and it was on this side of Cherry Creek, which is that creek right out there. And on the other side was Denver, and they fought over which was going to be the big city, the Queen City of the Plains. And Denver won. I don't know what the politics were at that time, and I'm fine not knowing probably. Um, I imagine there was some barroom discussions about that. But at any rate, if you go out and you want to take a walk and you go straight down that way, we preserved 9th Street Park and its original houses from this area. And they're the late 1800s, early 1900s. So again, if you're East Coast, you're going to say, oh, you're so young. But for Denver, this is really old. Um, it houses the Community College of Denver, so that's a two-year institution. MSU Denver is predominantly a four-year institution with some master's programs. And then University of Colorado at Denver is four-year, but also the graduate programs. There's a total of 42,000 students using this campus. Now, it's summer, so you won't see very many here right now. They're here, but just not at that level. And 5,000 faculty and staff. And when you go outside, I encourage you, again, to go outside and look around. If you look that way, you'll see downtown Denver in the skyline. If you look that way, you get to see the mountains. If you look that way, you get to see the Pepsi Center and um, Elitch Amusement Park. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Metropolitan State University of Denver. Right now, our theme is really transforming lives, communities, and higher education. Our president, Dr. Stephen Jordan, has been here for 10 years. He was hired because he was one of the most entrepreneurial presidents in the country at the time. And believe me, he's at the top of that list now. Um, but his vision for this institution is to be an urban land grant. So if you remember the land grant, and that was the Morrill Act in the late 1800s, it established institutions of higher ed in different states, and they were the experts for the farmers and ranchers. Well, he wants us to be the experts for the community of Denver and the surrounding suburbs. He wants us out acting in the community, just like he had the county extension agents, and he wants us, and he wants the community coming to us. So we talk about transforming the lives of our students, the community, and higher education as we lead in higher ed. Um, our values, and these resonate with all the employees here, are diversity, access for students, entrepreneurship, respect of all kinds of people, and the community. As a university, we have 21,000 undergraduate students. We're an modified open enrollment. What that means is 18 and 19 year olds have to meet our standards. Once you hit 20, we figure you're, you've matured enough that if you messed up in high school, we'll let you come in and get a degree. You still have to earn it, of course. Um, so there's some remedial work that those students often have to take. But 21,000 undergraduate students. We started three master's programs about four years ago. Um, in my college, the Master's of Social Work, and then we also have a Master's of Teaching and a Master's of Accountancy, and that's 450 students. We're about to embark on adding a couple more master's programs. We're sort of trying it and trying to get our infrastructure in shape. Um, I know that our Master's of Social Work students, 100% employment when they're done. They're concentrating on urban social work. Um, over a third of our students are students of color. A little over half are women, a little less than half are men. To me, it's not far from half. If we were doing politics, that would be a landslide for the women. 32% um, of our students are first-generation college students, so their parents did not go to college. We're a non-residential campus, and um, we, our average age of students is 26, so we have this broad diversity of students. I tell faculty as we're hiring them in that I think this is some of the richest teaching environments in the world. We're very active in LBTQ. I'm trying to, did I get all the letters in there, all those consonants? But we're very active in gender identification. We're very diverse ethnic, 
ethnicity wise, boy, I can't talk today. Ethnically, we're very diverse. Uh, we have all those ages. We'll have grandmothers graduate with their daughters or granddaughters. It's really fun. Um, so you get this diverse experiences in our classrooms, which give a, gives us really rich discussions. I'm the dean of the College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. It's the largest college at MSU Denver. We have three colleges and a school. 60% um, of our credit hour production is in Letters, Arts, and Sciences. We're a traditional arts and sciences or liberal arts college. We have 20 departments, including um, the Institute for Women's Studies and Services. It's called an institute because it does so many student services, but it's also an academic department. 36 majors, 43 minors, 14 certificates. I say that I have in the departments everything from A to Z, Africana Studies, and we have zoology. It's just buried in biology, so I don't have a Z down there. Um, I'll just run through them really quickly just as an introduction. So you've got to remember, I'm a biologist, and for me, being the dean of such a diverse college is just the greatest pleasure in the world. I'm always learning something. So I have the ethnic and gender studies departments. So we have an Africana studies department, Chicana Chicano studies, and women's studies. Um, just a few pictures of our students doing things in these departments. Um, in the bottom right corner, we do community outreach. Um, we have this program called Journey Through Our Heritage where we reach out to underserved students, um, both Latino and African American. We also have Caucasian students participate at times. But it's teaching them about their heritage and then trying to convince them that they need to go to college. Um, the Institute for Women's Studies and Services, it has a lot of community outreach. It's a leader on campus and social justice. We have the fine and performing arts. So we have the art department. We have our own art gallery down in the Santa Fe Arts District, and it does a lot of community outreach programs. You can see some of the pictures in the upper left-hand corner, right-hand from your view, um, of them working with, um, it looks like, elementary school kids. We have music. Here's the concert hall. We have an African drum ensemble. Um, we have our mariachi band shown there. Down in the lower right corner, um, our jazz groups go to a couple different bars around town. Now, how many deans get to go watch performances and drink beer? So at any rate, in that one, they're at the Mercury Cafe. They also perform at Jazzle um, Jazz Club. Um, theater, you can see that we have black box theaters, one for each of the three institutions. Um, we have a traditional theater down the hall. Humanities, that's where communications, arts, and sciences is. And communication studies, we have 366 major, majors. This was a couple years ago. They haven't updated it lately. Um, we just try and invite our students, since we're non-residential, into different activities on campus. So I just put up a couple quick brochures of that. Sciences is one of our really strong areas. This has the largest number of majors. So we have biology both in the laboratory and out in the field, so we have both kinds of biology. Earth and atmospheric sciences has multiple majors, um, including meteorology. Um, environmental science, land use, geology. Um, we have a very strong mathematical and computer sciences program. We have the social sciences. Um, history, they're throwing a graduation party, so it's fun to know that we do party some here, but being non-residential, not as much. Psychology is, has a large number of majors and a lot of student clubs. Um, social work, that's where we are offering a master's degree. So welcome to Colorado. Um, the weather is supposed to turn wet this afternoon, and even though meteorology is under me, I don't control the weather. Um, but it should be nice again um, by Friday afternoon, and it should be nice through the weekend. I hope that you can be here. Colorado is known for its mountains, its active outdoor lifestyle, Cultural activities. This is something that's new. This was a headline in the paper a couple months ago. Denver is number one in the nation for visits to the museum, theater, and music venues. Um, we have a well-developed craft brewing um, industry here. 
uh, we're actually developing a major in it, craft um, brewing sciences. And we have a highly educated population. So I'll just real briefly touch into your discipline. My discipline, as Karen said, my um, doctorate was in microbial, so microorganisms, ecology. And I'm going, media ecology? Well, I grow organisms on media, but what's media ecology? But I started with my own definition of ecology, which is the study of interactions between organisms, so organism to organism interactions, and then between the organisms and their environment and how they impact each other. And as I was thinking about that, I said, oh, that really fits. And then I went looking through, um, through your, what your sort of discipline describes yourself, and it's infused in every act and action in society. And I didn't have any really good pictures, so I did a trick-or-treat picture. And if you think about it, all these little girls, as princesses and fairy godmothers, we have a lion from the Wizard of Oz there. So the children are being impacted by media. And media influences our perceptions and our experiences, and it ties the world together. And I noticed that you have a number of um, uh, presentations that are on pedagogy and how media interplays with pedagogy. We're doing just-in-time teaching here. Um, I had a faculty, and he, he was really frustrated, and he was a young faculty. He went off on this rant in the wrong venue, disheveled hair, baby spit up on his shoulder, so I know he was just stressed to the max about his students playing on their phones and playing on their laptops during lecture. And I went from that meeting to an interview of a candidate for a job in the same department, and I asked my question, okay, so how do you engage your unengaged students? And she said, oh, last semester, she was teaching as an affiliate, I had a student who was always playing on his laptop, and this was history. And one day, I forgot a fact, so I asked him to look it up. Now, in his first quizzes, he'd been getting Ds, and he was not engaged, and she was like, oh. So she had him look it up for the class and tell her. And after that, she started engaging him in the class by having him look up facts, and the whole class got into it. He became a part of the learning community of that class, and he became a successful student. He got a B in the class instead of you know, flunking out as the road was. So that was a creative way of using media in the classroom. And, of course, I gave her the job. Um, but at any rate, welcome. I'm glad you're here, and thank you. Have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm going to introduce Dennis. Okay, our next leader. Um, let me start with asking a question. How many of you have had documentaries produced about your life and career? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, Dennis Gallagher, auditor for the city and county of Denver, is one of a kind in many ways. This Denver native, three Denver natives up here, were, were rare apparently, uh, was first elected to the Colorado House in 1970 and later served in the Colorado Senate and the Denver City Council. In 2001, the Media Ecology Association awarded him the Jack Elal Award for Outstanding Media Ecology Activism for his work on closing the digital divide. My first introduction to Dennis was as a PhD student at the University of Denver, and I just totally enjoyed his wit and his wisdom. As a young man, Dennis chose forensics and quickly became state champion, ranked eighth in the nation with his specialty of humorous storytelling. So I'm hopeful today we'll hear good, some good stories. He graduated from Regis College with a degree in English literature, specializing in Shakespeare and James Joyce, received a master's degree from Catholic University in Washington, D.C., returning to teach speech at Regis throughout his career while he worked in public service. He pursued a Ph.D. in human communication at the University of Denver, where he studied with Frank Dance. As much as he loves teaching, Dennis has devoted himself to public service. He is now completing his third term as Denver Auditor. Please join me in welcoming one-of-a-kind city auditor and media ecologist, Dennis Gallagher. Well, thank you, Karen, and thank you uh, for having me today. I uh, want to welcome you to our beautiful city of Denver. 
you're a mile above sea level, so be sure to breathe deeply while you're here. And also drink lots of water. You need more water at this mile above sea level business, and we don't want you to get dehydrated. And also remember, drinking alcohol takes away the water benefit, so be careful. I have roots on this campus. My, oh, and before I talk about that, I want to just say that Frank Dance wanted to be here. He, as you know, is welcoming into the world his newest grandchild, and he's in New Jersey. Uh, so aren't you glad we're here? Uh, and uh, we, we uh, are glad that Frank is continuing the good work of expanding his tribe. But uh, my roots on this campus go way back. My mother was born on this campus. Uh, her maiden name was Flaherty. And my grandpa, Flaherty, worked in a little bar a few blocks away from here, about where it's right across from the Tivoli on Larimer Street, 1142 Larimer Street. It was called Madden's Wet Goods as opposed to dry goods. And there, he was a great character. He, uh, when my grandpa lost his parents in a fire in St. Louis, East St. Louis, the nuns at the orphanage would send the kids out to work on farms in the summertime. And he was lucky enough to get on the Madden farm in a little place called Mexico City, Missouri, and right between Kansas City and St. Louis. And he uh, got to know the Maddens. And then the Maddens moved here to Denver and were on the police force and on the city council. Uh, Eugene Madden was a councilman. And at his bar down here on Larry, where my grandpa worked, 342 Democrats were registered to vote there. And the Denver Republican a newspaper asked Mr. Madden, the councilman, why are there so many people registered here who don't live here? He said, sir, the homeless deserve a place to vote. And they were all homeless, so he made sure they got to vote. I think some of them are still voting, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> the, uh, this was a great mixing together place. Auraria is always sort of a place where people uh, come passing through, passing on to somewhere else, as is Denver. When you came to Denver, you were looking for the gold in the mountains. And uh, some of our greatest fortunes in the United States were founded. The Guggenheims found their gold up in Leadville and then moved back to New York. You know, it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, but the, this uh, campus was full of lots of Germans, uh, lots of Jewish people uh, from Germany and Russia. And the, I, there were lots of Irish, Italians, and Hispanics also on, the, on this campus in those days. And there, the church down here, if you listen while you're here, try to time it so you're out during a, a notice of what, what the time is on the hour and the half hour. And the name of the church is St. Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth of Hungary Church. And the Franciscans went to Zhang Brewery, who uh, Mr. Zhang was from Germany, and he, uh, they told him that, Mr. Zhang, we can, if you donate the bells to our church, it won't go clang, clang. We can have them specially cla cast so they go zang, zang. And if you listen to those bells, there's a Z sound there uh, as, you, uh, as you hear that. So the Franciscans were pretty clever uh, about that. Uh, the, Denver is a great town. They were talking about all the different things going on. We now are known in the world for the marijuana capital of the U.S., and uh, it's priceless. The Denver City Council re, uh, a couple of years back allows four chickens in the yard. Any, any, do you have chickens in the yard yet? But you're allowed to have four chickens in the yard. In my neighborhood, it's nervous because I'm out closer to the mountains. Those foxes love the chickens. We got a lot of foxes coming through the little ditches that used to feed our agricultural interests. And so uh, the marijuana people, the marijuana establishments, have heard about these four chicken rule. And now they want to have a chicken yard next to their marijuana place so they can advertise pot in every chicken. <laughs> so, but anyway, I told that at Regis the other day in the library, not one student laughed. Shows you there's a little bit of an age difference here. 
But I was so pleased to be uh, teach at Regis. I taught Latin, Greek, and speech. And they also asked me to do an intro media class. So I uh, turned to the expert uh, for my media textbook, and I had my students read two, two texts. Uh, we, they read Understanding Media, and then they all, we also, as our project book, City as Classroom. It's, I, they are still, I require them, even though I'm no longer teaching there, I said, keep those on reserve, so don't let anybody take those books away. But, and because Regis is a good Jesuit school, we also had access to Father Walter Ong, who used to teach at Regis in the 1940s. And the kids couldn't figure out this name, Ong, O-N-G. They thought it sounded Chinese. So on the Regis laundry truck, they would write Ong's Laundry, meaning uh, that they thought he was of Chinese origin. Actually, it's, I asked him, it's actually of English extraction. But anyway, um, so when I would have my students go through all the chapters in understanding media, uh, we, uh, because uh, McLuhan would come to Denver and he would stay at Regis, and the Jesuits had a wonderful mountain cabin up in the mountains where he, he and the family would go, but for not a fee, but just to be generous. He would come to Regis and talk with the faculty and visit with the faculty. I can remember one time he said, let's everybody get, lay down on the floor and put your heads together. I mean, just creative like that, just getting the juices flowing. And so at the, and he, he signed all my books. I was looking for my understanding media autographed by McLuhan. Do you think I can find it? I saw it the other day and I said, I want to take it down and show everybody. Can't find it again, of course. But anyway, he, at the end of the year, or the, the class, we would arrange with McLuhan to have advanced media technology, a phone that would actually magnify into the room and the students would ask him questions based upon their readings for that semester. It was wonderful. The same was true of Father Ong when I was at, at DU. Father Ong, uh, we did a similar phone questioning type thing uh, with him in one of our classes. It was wonderful. And so uh, we remember fondly all those wonderful connections to McLuhan and Ong and all the wonderful media colleges that uh, set, set our lives in action. The, I think you've got a wonderful conference. I'm going to try to make as much of it as I can. Um, and we uh, think kindly of Walter Ong and Marsha McLuhan. May they be the saints that guide us through this weekend to make you nudge yourself harder and study harder to do so well in trying to figure out what the media are doing to us, for us, against each other, and not quite understanding what this is all about. I hope you have a great conference. And I'm going to close with a little song that uh, the city council always gets nervous whenever I start singing. But uh, I think it's, I don't sing for everybody. But I've counted how many people have come in. There's 54 here, and I'm going to sing for you 54 ecology, media colleges. And it's a little song that uh, welcomes uh, everybody to Colorado and a little bit about what it's about. And it's just a song about Denver and Colorado, and it goes like this. Way out west at the foot of the Rocky Mountains, there lies a place like a jewel in the sun, where fish are jumping higher than aspen tree. I know no other place I'd rather be, oh, which is the state we love the best? Colorado, which is the finest in the west? Colorado, where snow gleams and glistens and God stops to listen. C-O-L-O-R-A-D-O is my Home where the cowboy sings his song. This is the land where we belong. This is the place for you and me. Great to have you here in Denver, everybody. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Dennis. I appreciate it a lot.